Hi everybody, welcome back to our video. Uh, after a much needed week off, <clears throat> we're going to resume videos by talking about glacial interglacial cycles. And this is really the start of a brief little unit we'll do on climate. And this follows on a couple weeks of talking about energy. So obviously these are related because uh, energy produced from hydrocarbons puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That drives the greenhouse effect and changes climate. So what we're going to do now is, is spend some time looking at what we know about past climates and how we get that information and then how that information can be used to help us think about uh, modern climate change. And that's exactly why this lecture is important. Um, geologic records of climate change can give us context and analogs for modern climate change. And we'll look at some examples of that in a second. So where are we headed? Um, first, we're going to talk about what are glacial interglacial cycles. Then I'll introduce uh, sedimentary records that hold the record of glacial interglacial transitions. And then we'll talk specifically about how oxygen isotopes are used as an ice volume proxy that can record glacial interglacial cycles. So we'll start with the biggest picture timeline of Earth. Uh, this timeline goes from about <clears throat> 600 million years ago right up to the modern. And on this axis is an approximate reconstruction of Earth's temperature over that time. And what we see are these pretty huge swings in temperature from 12 degrees mean temperature up to 22 degrees mean temperature. These are huge swings. And we can roughly divide Earth's history into periods of either hothouse climate or into ice age climates. Ice age climates are times when there was extensive ice sheets covering the high latitude regions. So it turns out that we're actually in an ice age climate right now this one that's been going on since about 35 million years ago, right up here. Before that, we were in a long hothouse period where temperatures were almost 10 degrees hotter than they are today, and there was absolutely no ice on Earth, and we would have had tropical conditions covering much of Earth, even in the Northern Hemisphere. So we can see these big ice ages and these big hothouse periods, and I think one of the interesting things about this record is that although we are definitely warming the planet today, we've got a long way to go before we reach temperatures as warm as we've had during much of Earth's history. Now, during a given ice age, like the one that we're in now, uh, Earth can oscillate between glacial and interglacial periods. And we know that this happens on a roughly 100,000 year time scale. During glacial periods, ice sheets advance down and cover much of North America and also much of Asia as well. During inter interglacial periods, we see uh, that ice retreat back to some limited ice extents. Um, maybe glaciers just covering some of northern Canada here uh, and some of Greenland. So where we are today, we're currently in an interglacial period within a larger ice age. So we're at, we're at an interglacial time, but relative to deep Earth history, we're still in an ice age. So how do we reconstruct these records of, of ice volume and climate? An important record comes from sedimentary rocks. And specifically, we're going to think about using clay-rich marine sediments. Um, and within these sediments, we find shells that are made of calcium carbonate. And these shells grow in the ocean. And as a result, they record a record of both the carbon and the oxygen that's in the ocean water at any given time. So we can think of these shells as basically little sampling machines that live, they sample the carbon and oxygen in the water, they store it in their shell, and then they die and they sink to the bottom of the ocean where they're incorporated in the ocean sediment. Um, now, because the ocean is connected to other parts of the hydrologic cycle, so the atmosphere, the land, the glaciers, 
Um, in effect, these shells are really not just recording conditions in the ocean, they're also recording conditions across all of Earth. And we'll look at that in a second. Now, these shells in the, the marine sediment cores are incredibly useful for a couple reasons. One is that it's a continuous record. When we go to the deep ocean, sediments accumulate at a fairly continuous pace, and there's not usually a lot of interruptions. So we got this really continuous record over time, and that's really important if you want to look at climate changes. And then also we have good age control. Um, the sediments can be dated using a variety of different techniques, and we can get pretty good age models uh, throughout the sediment core. So we can actually uh, directly place our carbon and oxygen records in a time frame that's accurate. Uh, now, where do we get these marine sediment cores? There's an ongoing drilling program called the Ocean Drilling Program, or the ODP. And they have their own ship called the Joids Resolution, a specially built ship with a big drill rig on top of it. And they go around uh, and drill holes in the ocean. And here's a compilation. Looks like maybe only through 2003. So there's probably a lot of new holes. And you can see they each year they pick where they're going to drill. They might decide they want to drill off the coast of North America, or they might decide they want to drill you know, near the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, or maybe up in the Arctic. So depending what kind of record they're looking for, uh, they'll pick a different place to drill. So now let's look in more carefully at how we actually use these calcium carbonate shells to actually reconstruct ice volume. <clears throat> we do this using uh, a technique called oxygen isotopes, or measuring oxygen isotopes. And they're quite often measured in these little shells of an organism called foraminifera. So these are little organisms that they can live either on the surface or the bottom of the ocean. Um, but in any event, they grow and they incorporate carbon and oxygen into their shell and then they die and they're in the sediments. Now scientists will measure the ratio of two different oxygen isotopes. That's oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Now remember that isotopes are versions of the same element. So they have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So oxygen 18 has two additional neutrons relative to oxygen 16. And that makes it a little bit heavier. And that extra heaviness actually causes it to behave a little bit differently, uh, especially during the process of evaporation. And that, so that different mass is going to cause what we call fractionation. It's going to cause the isotopes to behave differently uh, in certain situations. And so when that happens, we end up um, changing the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. And so this ratio, as it changes, can actually be a proxy for different processes that are happening in the ocean. And we usually express the ratio in what's called a delta notation here. Um, and all you really need to know is that a larger delta means more oxygen 18. So it means if you see a larger delta, it means more of the heavier isotope. OK, so in summary, these four aminifera are going to take oxygen into their shell, and they're going to record the oxygen isotope ratio at that specific moment when they were growing. So who cares? Why are the oxygen isotope ratios changing? Well, they change, among other things, as a function of global ice volume. And so that's why they're able to track ice ages. And let's take a look at how this works. During the process of evaporation, the lighter isotope, 16, is preferentially evaporated off the ocean. So that means the clouds are filled with the lighter oxygen. And they carry that lighter oxygen in the form of water vapor out over land, and it rains. Uh, and if it's if it's an ice age, 
That's not actually rain. That's actually snow. And the snow falls on the ice caps and turns into ice. <clears throat> now the significant thing is that the oxygen 16 is preferentially locked in that ice. It doesn't flow back into the ocean, okay? So what ends up happening is during ice ages, when there's a lot of ice accumulating, or during glacial periods, I should say, um, the ice ends up being enriched in oxygen 16, so it would have a lower delta value, and the ocean ends up being depleted in oxygen 16, so it would have a higher delta value. And of course, the foraminifera are growing and recording these changes in the ocean over time. And so during an ice age, those foraminifera are going to record a particularly high 18 to 16 ratio, or a high delta value. So scientists over the years have taken many sediment cores and measured the isotope ratio in many foraminifera. And here's the record that they've put together. We've got time along this axis from zero to two and a half million years here. And here's the oxygen isotope record. So when it gets heavy, it's cold. When it gets warm, uh, excuse me, when the ratios get high, it's cold. When the ratios get low, it's warm. So we see this oscillation between ice age, excuse me, glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial, glacial, interglacial. And it turns out that that's happening on roughly uh, 100,000 year time scales. And what we see most recently is that beginning at around 125,000 years, Earth slipped into its current glacial period following this trajectory. And then recently, over only about the last 15,000 years, that, gla that glacial period abruptly ended and we've fallen into our current interglacial. So we've only been in this interglacial for about 10,000 or 15,000 years. And prior to that, for the 80,000 years prior, we were in a glacial period. Another important thing here is this gives us often a sawtooth pattern where we seem to work our way slowly into glacial periods but then the termination of the glacial periods seems to happen really, really quickly. So we go into them slowly, but we come out really fast. So something abrupt happens that terminates the glacial period and spits us into an interglacial. And we'll be thinking more about that in upcoming videos. So here's a zoomed image of the last million years, just another look at this data. And I'll end the video by saying, um, what we're seeing here is really ice volume. And so this record tells us that it also gives us a pretty precise timing. So it's very good at uh, establishing the, the temporal resolution. And if we know the ice volume, we can back out information about sea level as well. Turns out sea level was about 100 meters lower during the, le the peak of the last glaciation. Imagine that, 100 meter lower sea level pretty significant. But the record also doesn't tell us a lot of things. It doesn't tell us the exact temperature. It doesn't tell us anything about the regional climate. So it doesn't tell us how climate might have been different in Europe versus the United States or South America. Um, it also doesn't tell us what's causing these cycles. And this is a huge question mark. What is causing these cycles? And that's where we're going to pick up in the next video. So in summary, this is what you've just learned. And I'll leave you with a concept question and a link to the quiz. Join us for the next video where we'll look at climatic forcings and feedbacks and try to understand what's caused these glacial interglacial cycles. Thanks.